Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. There are a few announcements that I'd like to call your attention to in the bulletin. Uh, Wednesday night meals will start back this Wednesday and you'll want to stick around for the worship service afterwards. It's gonna be a very special worship service for the next few weeks. R.B. and Elise are going to uh, lead us through the teachings of Jesus Christ through a remarkable book study called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. So we hope that you'll be here on Wednesday evenings. And um, there are several mission opportunities that crank back up this week, so you'll want to look through those. If you would like to sign up, the sign-ups are outside the office door, or you can give me a call here at the church. We also want to continue to extend our Christian love and sympathy to Jill Malk and her family, and Kathy Letzinger and her family on the loss of their brother, Paul Baldwin. Uh, we also want to extend our love and sympathy to the family of Kat McLean. Kat had been a member of St. Paul's for about four years and was a member of Harmony Circle and passed away suddenly last week. And we want to remember her family also. And the rose on the altar is a happy celebration of the birth of Brewer Shaw Boyd, son of Morgan and Tyler Boyd. Grandparents are Melissa and Dan Hoover, and great-grandmother is Pat Hoover. So we welcome little Brewer to the world. Um, and you can read the rest for yourselves. And let's uh, bow our heads in prayer as we begin to our worship. Dear Lord, we know that you are here with us today. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to hear your voice. Come, Spirit, come. Amen. Please stand and join with me in this morning's call to worship. <clears throat> the voice of God prods our hearing. The activity of God stretches our seed. Together they invite us down into the waters of life where the Spirit flows. To 
Let's please remain standing for our opening hymn number 220, Angels from the Realms of Glory. As you remain standing, let us unite our voices in our historic confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Allow me to call your attention to the back of our bulletin as we think of our joys and concerns. First, we have a number of people having birthdays this week and others having anniversaries. If you know them, if you come across their paths, be sure to congratulate them on these milestones that various ones have achieved. Also on the prayer list, let me lift up those church members who are in need of our prayers, the, the family of Carmen Jackson, the family of Kat McLean, and the family of Britt McCoy, uh, the family of Buddy Moore, the family of Phil Baldwin. As you can see, in the last 10 days or so, we've had a number of funerals connected to our church family. And yet one of our joys, as we said earlier, Brewer, Shaw, Boyd, 
and we are grateful for this new life in our church family as well. Let us now pause for a moment of meditation. Lord and our God, we are amazed that you created both the heavens and the earth. You created the, the sun and the wondrous stars and the moon in the sky. And you created the trees that are beautiful and the lakes and the seas. And you created us and your spirit lives within us as we place our faith in Christ. We connect with your spirit as we place our love in Christ toward each other. We connect with each other. We thank you for the wonders and the miracles that you create in our lives. And yet we confess that we have wandered away because of our own sinful passions. We've wandered away from your presence that comforts us, your presence that guides us. We've gone off sometimes, it feels as if into a distant land, and now we want to return and embrace your loving kindness. May we experience your forgiveness deep within, and may we make a brand new start this morning. We thank you for how you have touched us in so many ways as we begin this new year. May we think in terms of the small gifts. We probably have not even thought about the shoes on our feet, and there are so many in this world that are shoeless. We probably have not thought much today about the clothes that we are wearing except when we were looking in the mirror this morning and yet there are so many that do not have a change of clothes. You have blessed us in so many ways. May our hearts be filled with gratitude as we count the many blessings and name them one by one in our lives. And now we pray for those that we've called by name, those families that are going through grief. We ask as the great comforter that you will bring comforting peace to their wounded hearts we thank you for the gift of new life, this baby boy in our church family. And we also pray for this time in our church family as we think about what we can do for the kingdom of God. May we look at our spiritual gifts. May we look at our abilities and make a renewed commitment to do what we can to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We're grateful for our speaker today, Veronica Pritchard. We ask that you will touch her deep within, to share from her heart what can inspire us. And these are our prayers that we offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings, Please remember to place the dollar that makes a difference in the plate. <clears throat> it really does make a difference. We've been able to help several different organizations during this past year, and we will continue with this quarter's givings also. Let us pray. God of the water that cleans us, the land that feeds us, and the air that allows us to breathe your spirit in and out of us, you claim us in our baptism, but too few of us even remember our own baptism. And if we remember our baptism, we too rarely grasp its meaning and power. As we present our tithes and offerings in worship and witness Christ's baptism once again, may we remember that in that water we were, like Christ, commissioned to go to teach, to preach, heal, 
and even take up a cross. In Christ we pray. Amen. children to come forward for a special message from Miss Jill. My two favorite people. How are y'all this morning? Everybody's good? Good. Well, today is a special day in the church. It's called Epiphany Sunday. Can you say Epiphany? Epiphany. Yes, good. It has four syllables. Epiphany. Say it. Epiphany. Good job. That's why the Christmas tree is still up, because the, it's the Christmas tree. And so today is a special day in the church. And have you all ever heard that word before, epiphany? Okay. Well, it means, um, it's sometimes called the twelfth night, okay? It is 12 days after Christmas. Have you ever heard that song, the 12 days of Christmas on the first day? Okay. Well, those 12 days of Christmas begin on Christmas Day and go through Epiphany, which was January 6th. Today is January 8th, so we celebrate Epiphany Sunday today. And um, it is the day when we celebrate the kings, the wise men, arrive to baby Jesus. Because remember, they had to travel a long way. And so it's the day we celebrate that they arrived on Christmas. And the word epiphany means light, okay? It's a symbol um, for epiphany, the light. And why do you think light might be a symbol for epiphany? Who, was the, who is the light of the world? Jesus, good job. 
And so on Christmas, I talked to you all about Jesus. And we said that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus brings light in the darkness. So when we go through dark times, right, Jesus is with us and gives us light and reminds us that there is always hope, right? Um, So I brought this rock, okay? Now, this rock is not very pretty, is it? Okay, in fact, it, it's kind of ugly. It's, it's just kind of brown. And, um, but if you crack this rock open, it's actually a very special kind of rock called a geode, okay? And when you crack this rock open, I want to show you what it looks like on the inside. Okay, can you see the crystals on the inside? See how they sparkle? Okay, so this rock kind of reminds me of the way Jesus is. Um, The Bible tells us that Jesus was just um, an ordinary man. He was fully human, but he was also fully God, okay? The Bible says that Jesus just looked ordinary on the outside, and but on the inside, he had the love of God. He was fully God. Now, the Bible also tells us that when we have the love of Christ in us, we can reflect that light of Jesus, right? So we're ordinary on the outside. When we have Jesus, we can sparkle like that. We do that with the words that we say, right? We do that with the actions we show. The way we treat other people is a big part of us reflecting the love of Jesus in all the things that we do. So when we love and we follow Jesus, we have this. Now, I'm going to give you all one of these to take home. My intent this morning was to break one of these open during the children's sermon. But when I did that <clears throat> on Friday, it's really, 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 really hard. <laughs> so I'm going to give you all one of these to take home, and you can maybe get Johnny to help you crack that open. And um, you all can see what that one looks like on the inside. They're supposed to, some of them are even hollow, and you can break them open and see what they look like, okay? All right, let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, who is our guiding light. Help us as we strive to live like Jesus and show his love to others with our words and our actions. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jill, for leading us in worship with our children's sermon, and thank you, choir, of course, for that special music. For our scripture reading this morning, we'll begin with Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth... I tell you of them. Also from the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 29 reads as follows. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf. 
and Sirion like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And also from the New Testament, we read from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Will you please stand with me for the reading of the Gospel? Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Oh 
Good morning. I would like to start by inviting you to close your eyes to experience darkness this morning. Close your eyes and see the darkness and hear these words from 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. And like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. You may open your eyes. Did you see the light even in the darkness? Good morning, I am Reverend Veronica Pritchard. Um, some of you look very familiar to me. I have met you either when I came and turned water into wine right here in this very pulpit, um, whether it was at one of the women's spiritual retreats or a UMW retreat, or maybe it was um, Katie Elliott over there who she and I used to attend the same church together in Mississippi. Or perhaps you have attended a retreat at Delta Grace. I want to thank you. I want to thank Kathy once again for inviting myself and my husband, David. David, say hello so they, they see who you are. Um, to come to speak to you about Delta Grace. I want to say what a beautiful sanctuary you have. And um, I remember... The first time I stepped in to the sanctuary of Sunflower United Methodist Church. I'm the pastor at the Moorhead United Methodist Church and Sunflower United Methodist Church in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. I served at um, one time in the Louisiana Conference. I was in, in the Gonzales Church and I was in First Alexandria with Tim and Linda Beth Newstifter. And, um, so, and then we moved to Mississippi. And while I was there, I um, got a calling to go and preach one or two sermons at the Sunflower United Methodist Church and the Moorhead United Methodist Church. Their pastor was out on medical leave and they needed someone just for a couple weeks. And that was April 2011 and I'm still there. <laughs> they can't seem to get rid of me. But I was told that when their pastor um, decided he was not going to come back, they would shut the doors of the church. That first Sunday at Sunflower United Methodist Church, I had never been in a Methodist church or any church in that kind of condition. It was downright scary. The ceilings were falling in. The walls were covered with mold and mildew. Uh, the men's restroom was all the way down at the end of the hall past the Sunday school classes. And there was so much junk in the hall that you were afraid to go all the way down to the hall. It was in deplorable condition. The congregation that had gathered that morning, all four of them, came for one reason, and it was to worship God. You could feel in that sanctuary, even though it was not a beautiful place, it was once a school built in the late 40s, and um, it felt like a school, but when you walked into that sanctuary, even though there were water spots on the ceiling and you knew that on a rainy day you were very picky of where you sat to worship, or the pews had water spots on them from the drips from the ceiling, or the walls were cracked from the plaster shifting in the alluvian soil of the Mississippi Delta. But yet, that Sunday morning when we walked in, you could feel the Holy Spirit in that room. I thought, okay, God, I'll preach here for a couple weeks. It was an hour from my home. Surely God would not keep me there. And he did. As a new clergy in, the, in the state of Mississippi, I was given a PowerPoint about the Mississippi Delta, and it talked about... Um, the poverty in Mississippi. It talked about the education system. I thought when I was in Louisiana that we were 50, but we're not 50. The 50 of Mississippi 
and the 49 of Louisiana is a huge gap. It talked about the racial division still very much. I was surprised when I got there to, to Sunflower. There was a black grocery store and there was a white grocery store. And we're talking in the last 10 years. But God had a calling for that small church of four people over the age of 75 years old. It was still a church, and God called it to do ministry. And the people there were willing to step up with a crazy pastor to do something new. That we were to be God's hands and feet in a community that had lost hope. And so birth Delta Grace. Delta Grace, as some of you know, is a mission hub in the heart of Mississippi. We took that church of uh, four members and we renovated it um, only by the grace of God. Through donations and grants and volunteers, we started with a, a group of volunteers out of Slidell, Louisiana at the Epworth Project. And they came and they helped us work on our facility and then we began opening doors as God just poured grace upon grace. We needed bunk beds, bunk beds showed up. We needed ceilings, God sent sheetrock. We needed roofers, God sent roofers. It didn't matter what we needed before we could even pray about it, God sent it to us. This is a God-ordained ministry. It is nothing that we started. We just were willing to use whatever manifold grace God gave us to be good stewards of that and do it. And so in, but we started working on the facility, and by January of 2014, we um, hosted our first team. Since then, we have hosted uh, more than 2,700 missioners have come through Delta Grace from 22 different states. They've come from California and Florida and Illinois and um, a lot on the, the East Coast. We've had them from Boston. We've had them all the way from Louisiana have come to, to serve at Delta Grace. What we do is after that first project that we worked on in January 2014, we did a media blitz of people to come and if you have work that you need done on your home, fill out an application. Our applications consist of this. What's your name? What's your address? Who lives in your home? What do you want done? And what church do you go to? We know that if God sends us to that house, that's where we need to be. Most of the homes that we work on are in um, the word, I, I can't think of any other word, but deplorable conditions. You drive by the house and they look just fine, but inside they are not. The work that we do um, is home repair. It's all we do is home repair. And we do it um, for those that do not have the means to do it themselves. Most of the people that we work on are um, widowers or widows that have tried to do the work themselves. Here's some of the people that we have worked, homes we have worked on. This is Mr. Robert. Mr. Robert um, lived in his, uh, in his home two years before we had gotten there. His water pipes had frozen and he, could, he had no running water in his house. We had a mission team come in from Memphis, Tennessee, and they fill out a little uh, survey of what skills they have, and all of them said, no plumbing skills, no plumbing skills, no plumbing skills. <laughs> well, that team ran new pipes in Mr. Roberts' home. The, um, here's another one, Miss Gertrude. Miss Gertrude is 95 years old when we worked on her house. It's not unusual for three, four, and five generations to be, work, uh, to be living in the same house. Miss Gertrude was the matriarch of the family and owned the house, and she needed a wheelchair ramp. But when we went to her house, we found that throughout her house, there were little holes 
in her floors. And she had Walmart bags stuck in those little holes to keep critters from coming up into her house. And what we found when we went over there was her water heater and her washing machine were leaking under the house. So it wasn't just water under the house, it was hot water under the house. And so it deteriorated her floor. And her little great, great, maybe it's four generations, um, grandson, that's the one in the, in the pajamas there, uh, kept falling through the holes in the floor. And so we had a team come in from Hagerstown, Indiana, that was able to fix the leaking pipes. We were able to pull up the floor, put new floors in for them. Here's another one, Mr. Joe. Mr. Joe, when we went to his house, we had a team from Alabama that came in to work on his roof, and we found that when we took the shingles off, underneath the shingles was rotted plywood, and so when we took the plywood off, then we could see into his dining room. He had no attic, he had no ceiling in his house. So not only was his roof leaking, but there was no insulation to keep him from the Mississippi Delta heat um, in his home. Mr. Milton, we see things like this all the time. This is Mr. Milton's wheelchair ramp. Someone had gone in and built for him. We deal with a lot of people in the Mississippi Delta that has diabetes, and so he, they're either, you know, they're, they are amputees. And so for Mr. Milton, his 12-year-old granddaughter was the only one strong enough to push him up into the house on that ramp. One more story, Miss Lalitha, we went to her house um, to build her a small, um, just four inch ramp. And when we went in there, she said, what about my bathroom? And so David, who is our construction manager, goes in to look at her bathroom and her bathroom was fine. And so she, she's a double amputee, you could see that. And what she did is she took that wheelchair and she rolled it as forward as fast as she could and ran into the doorway because the doorway of her bathroom was only 28 inches and she could not get her wheelchair through the door. So for five years, her son had to carry her in the bathroom every time she had to go to the bathroom or every time she wanted to take a bath. In a day, one day, a team came in, took out the 28-inch door, put a 36-inch door in, and it was like it was like freedom for her. She, when she walked, when she rolled into the bathroom, she was so excited uh, that she could go in there by herself. What we do is we work on homes that have um, four issues. They either have uh, sanitary issues. Um, we work on their kitchens, their bathrooms, um, things like that. We work on safety issues, like is the two-year-old falling through the floor. We work on, oh, I forgot my other S. Safety, security, uh, security. Can they uh, lock their windows? Can they lock their doors? or spiritual, or all spiritual, is God sending us there. One of my favorite stories was we had a junior high uh, team that came in. You know how junior high kids can be? They're so active, and they wanted to do something, and it's like, what can we do with them? Well, the house just needed new receptacle covers put on, and so they could do that. We taught them how not to put the um, screwdriver into the unit. You know. But anyway, they were able to change the plates on everything. But what they did, what the junior high uh, girls and boys did, is they made the homeowner a necklace, one of those beaded necklaces like you make in, in vacation Bible school with her name on it. And you thought it was made of gold. She was so proud of that necklace. Real quick, I'm going to show you some before and afters. Here's one of Mr. Johnny's house. Um, like I said, lots of people come in and build them wheelchair ramps. Uh, what we do is we, we build them according to ADA, and there's an after of Mr. Johnny's house. Here's one of uh, Miss Faye's. Miss Faye, uh, that is not filth within her bathtub. She has scrubbed it so much, she scrubbed the porcelain off of it. 
And um, so here's an after of her bathroom. Here is Miss Annie's. Miss Annie, if you look where that uh, arrow is, you can see her kitchen cabinets are collapsing in. This is very common um, of the homes we work on. Where the arrow is, that's her walking cane holding up her cabinets from falling in. And here's an after. We love before and after pictures. This next picture is the house of Miss Johnny Mays. Johnny, someone did Miss Johnny May a favor and built a bay window in her house. Miss Johnny May sent the application to us and she had lots of things going on. One of the things that she needed was a new roof. But before we could get there, she couldn't wait on us. She ended up getting a new roof. But we were able to do a new window for her so, and put some new siding on it. But inside her home, this is what happens when they don't have roofs. Inside her home, this is what it looked like. Yes, and so um, every room was like this. Her ceilings were falling in, and she was trying so hard not only to take care of her home, but also to raise her grandchildren. And so we were able to also not only do the new window for her, but do, uh, we actually did a bathroom, a kitchen, and sheetrock and ce uh, ceilings and walls for her. We don't do a lot of painting. They can, homeowners can usually get someone to paint for them. Um, and we, we, we try to focus on um, other needs than, than painting. But if you haven't heard anything else this morning, if your eyes are still closed and you're still looking for the light this morning, I want you to hear this. Delta Grace is not about fixing up homes. Please hear that. The Mississippi Delta does not need your money. They do not. The government pours more money into the Mississippi Delta than they know what to do with. What they do need is your love. Delta Grace is about 10% hammer and nails and 90% relationships. I was talking to Kathy this morning and she says, I can remember, um, I think you've brought three or four teams there. She says, I can remember every homeowner that we worked on. She said, one homeowner gave us seeds when we left. That's what we want you to do is come and plant seeds in the Mississippi Delta. Seeds of hope, seeds of love. You have been there to the Mississippi Delta. Some of you have been to Delta Grace, but I'm encouraging you uh, to come for more of you to come. I don't know what I did with my slide that said, we have received to date 610 applications of people who need work done on their homes within a 30 minute radius of our church. We started with um, an hour, within an hour, but we found the need was so huge that we moved it down to 30 minutes. Within a 30 minute radius of our church, we have received over 610 applications. Since January of 2014, we've worked on 221. The homes that we are working on right now turned their applications in in 2017. There is over a five year wait and homeowners call constantly saying, how soon will my house be worked on? And I said, keep praying. When God sends that team, to, we will have them work on your home. We always need more teams. If this is something that you think you are at all interested doing, Kathy is going to have a sign up for you out there. 
But I invite you, I encourage you, I, if you've been there and you can't go again, I want you to tell anybody and everyone that you know. We are a United Methodist Volunteer and Mission Approved site. So we are promoted globally. And um, it's not just United Methodist. We've had Baptists. We've even had Jewish people there, Jewish teams serving. So please tell people about Delta Grace. Please come and serve. Please support. If someone cannot go, um, make it like your, your women's retreat. Say, I know you can't go because you have small children, but I'll take your children for the weekend so you can go. Or, I know you can't go because it, maybe it doesn't fit in your budget, but here, here's some money for you to go. The missioners tell me how long they want to come, so they choose the dates they come, they, they pay a fee, and the f money that you pay pays for all the materials for that project. So we handpick, David handpicks the projects for your team, and he watches. You don't even have to have construction skills. If it's 90% relationships, then a two, our youngest missioner has been three years old. Because a mama with a three-year-old sitting, visiting with a homeowner is that 90%. Don't tell me you're too old. I've had a 93-year-old man, an electrician, come, and he's come quite a few times. So don't tell me it's an age limit. People ask me, I'm going to close with this, uh, this story. People ask me, why do we do Delta Grace? Why is it we do Delta Grace? Is it because every homeowner is so grateful? Absolutely not. Some of them um, want more. You leave there and they're like, what about this? What about this? And it's not that they want more. It's that they need more. And so it's, it's and then you have the homeowners that um, are constantly calling. They want to know of that 610 applications, they want to know how soon can they turn another application in after that. And they're willing to wait five, six, seven years to have more work done on their house. Well, if it's not the homeowners, it must be the missioners. It must be you that come and make our, um, our, our ministry so wonderful. And I'd like to say, yes, every one of you, but no, not every one of you. You get those that um, are constantly wanting to do it their way instead of how we're guiding those. Or you get those um, very interesting ones, like we had a, a youth team come in two summers ago, and they did a roof, and uh, the youth director was smart enough to give them all water bottles so that they had something, uh, made sure they were hydrating up on the roof. And they were really, it was, a, it was a, a big church because they gave them all these really fancy aluminum water bottles with their names on it. Very nice. Well, one of the boys thought that uh, he would be so kind um, to put the water bottle of someone else's aside so it wouldn't roll off the roof. But when he put it aside, he was looking for a place to put it, and he found this pipe sticking out of the roof just about the right size. And he set that water bottle on that pipe, and bloop, it went down, the vent pipe. It was just the right size to slide down, but it had a little hook on the top, a little handle on the top, and he didn't tell us until a day later. And David's like, okay, we can get this out. It went down 15 feet. I can hook it and pull it up. Well, when he hooked it to pull it up, the lid came off. Then, well, you couldn't use a magnet because it was aluminum. He's like, what can I do? Well, the team left. We didn't have another team for about three days. And in that three days, it rained. And it rained. 
And before we knew it, when we went back three days later, the homeowner says, my sink is not draining very well. It must be from the rain. We knew exactly what it was from. And David was able to create a harpoon to get down. We thought we were going to have to take the wall out and the pipe out to a section of the pipe, but we didn't. He was very creative and got it out of there. So it's not the homeowners, it's not the missionaries, it's not because we're real nice people, believe me. We're, you know, we may be nice, but we're not that nice. I can think of a hundred other ways in which to serve God rather than to serve him in the Mississippi Delta. We don't even live in the Mississippi Delta. We live an hour away. We have a beautiful home that sits on 200 acres out there, and I would much rather be out in the rolling hills of Mississippi than to be in the Mississippi Delta. So why? Why do we do Delta Grace? Well, I finally figured it out. It is because of this little girl. This little girl was, built, was born in the um, early 20s. And when she became a teenager, about 15 years old, um, it was during the Depression was starting and things were tough and her parents tried very hard to provide for her and if um and and whatever they did um she at that age didn't seem that grateful she was the oldest of four and um, she was kind of a defiant little girl and at the age of 15 she decided she wasn't going to go to school that day and her dad said, you are going to school or you're getting off my lunch ticket. Have you ever said that to your teenager or something similar? Well, he meant it. And so she decided, I'm getting off his lunch ticket. And she decided to get married. Well, her boyfriend that day um, was getting ready to go off to the service. And so she decided she'd marry his brother. And they married, and in, at the age of 16, she had her first child, and then her second, and then her third, and then her fourth. He tried very hard to make ends meet. There was never, ever enough money. Then their fifth, their sixth, their seventh, their eighth. Their ninth, their tenth, they never had a home to live in. They'd live in rental houses or they'd live, she ran a restaurant for a little while and they would live in the back room. There were two, uh, evidently there were two large back rooms in the back of the restaurant and they could, they could stay there. The eleventh child came along, the twelfth. Finally, he was able to scrape up enough money after the 12th child to buy her a wedding ring. She had never had a church wedding or a wedding ring, and so she loved her wedding ring. 13th, 14th, after the 14th child, he was able to buy her a home. This was her home that she lived in. It wasn't much of a home. It was an old schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse, and he thought, I can fix this up. And so he started tearing out um, the old plaster and putting sheetrock in. He dropped the ceiling in order to make an upstairs. He was going to have bedrooms everywhere for his children. But... He tried hard to make it a home. The sheetrock was never finished. The upstairs, never finished. Insulation was not put in the roof. The bathroom in this house was the equivalent of an outhouse indoors. There was never any running water in this house. The furnace hardly worked and um, absolutely no air conditioning. She tried very hard to do everything she could to make this house a home for her children. And what happened was, on her 40th wedding anniversary, they got married in a church. 
She was so excited. And four months later, he passed away. After he passed away, she continued to live in the house and try to make it, uh, keep it uh, a home, and it wasn't long before the roof started leaking. And so she had to pawn that wedding ring that he had bought her. Some people called that woman Dorothy. I called her mom. That was the home that I grew up in. Every home that you work on for Delta Grace is my mama's home, who tried so hard to provide for her children. I ask you to please consider being good stewards of the manifold grace of God and sign up to come and serve at Delta Grace. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining, and like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gifts each of you has received. Won't you be the light in someone's darkness? Let us pray. God of grace, God of mercy, God of light, we offer ourselves to you to make a difference in others' lives. Use us however you will, for it is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is my favorite hymn of all. It's what the hymn that called me to missions way back in, in 1989 at a UMW retreat, number 593, Here I Am, Lord. <laughs>
Thank you, thank you, Veronica. Inspiring message. I'm going to ask you to go and stand in the narthex. Paula, could you show her the narthex? And everybody, please visit with Veronica right after the worship service. Thank you so much for being here today as we have worshiped the Lord. Let us now go to God in prayer for our benediction. Heavenly Father, we have been truly blessed. May we pause not only to give you thanks, but may we also ask a simple question. Since you're sending us somewhere, may we follow your leadership, whether it be here in Washita Parish or in the Mississippi Delta. May we follow where you send. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Go in peace. Thank you.